All right, so we just lost somebody, so hopefully they come back. All right, well, welcome everybody to the June virtual meeting of our Wild One Central Wisconsin chapter. Uh, I'll be starting off with a few updates tonight. This is Paul Skowinski, the president of the chapter. Carrie is also on the call, our vice president. She has a sore throat, so I'll say her name for her. Carrie Adi uh, is with us. So uh, our other two board positions, um, the secretary position is vacant right now, and the treasurer, uh, Ben, is, is not with us tonight. So the first update that I wanted to give was about the, our Piffner Park shoreline project that we did last month. We had over 1,500 plants that ended up going into that planting. Um, we had some coverage from Channel 7 out of Wassa that showed up and did an interview with me and with the mayor and had some coverage about the plants and, and people planting and things like that. So that was good coverage for that project. And uh, we've got a, a newspaper article coming out soon. They're gonna interview me and the Parks Department soon for that. That's a big cooperative project between the Stevens Point Parks Department and um, our Wild Ones chapter. So please walk by throughout the summer and check it out as it starts to bloom and really uh, grows and matures. Lots of people helped with this project from our chapter and also from the Stevens Point Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club. So it was a big collaboration and I'm really excited to see it starting to flourish. Um, here's a couple of pictures of the project site before anything. So this is what it used to look like. It was all just turf and a lot of the shoreline was badly eroding away. So we had the Parks Department put down black plastic. They had a, uh, two layers of black plastic with sandbags on top. And we smothered the grass for about five weeks in um, late March through April and into early May. And then this is what it looked like when we were all finished. So we have a couple of full color aluminum signs that are posted on cedar posts next to the garden at each corner. So uh, as people are, approach the garden from either side, they see the sign and the garden was designed to be the most impressive as far as the floral display on the ends. So as people are walking up to the garden from either end, there's a big show of cardinal flowers and monkey flowers and some showy sedges, blazing stars, things like that. And um, there's about 20 species total throughout this site. It's about 140 feet of shoreline along the Wisconsin River in downtown Stevens Point. Another project that's coming up is the uh, redoing the gardens in front of Schmeekley Reserve in Stevens Point. And I see Jill is on the call. Um, this is a project that I don't think needs too much work. It had a lot of mulch on it before, like 10 inches of mulch. So the excess mulch has been removed and the challenge now is just putting some additional plants back into the site uh, that deer won't eat because there's a lot of deer in Schmeekly. They hang out there, they cannot be hunted. They are basically domesticated. <laughs> they don't care if anybody walks right past them. And so they'll walk right up to the building and eat all the plants. Um, so we're probably gonna put some grasses and sedges in there and maybe a, a few deer resistant forbs into the site. So if you're interested in helping out with that, contact myself or Jill, and uh, we're hoping to get something going on this later this, this spring or early summer. So here's the other garden in front of the nature center. There's still some prairie drop seed and some sedges and things uh, hanging on there. But a lot of the other plants have probably just been eaten by the deer over time. Uh, last thing I'll mention, I had to dig up a good chunk of my front yard for a road reconstruction project. And uh, much of our path had to be removed. So the sedges that I had in my path, if you've been to my house, uh, you, you've probably seen the path in the front yard. We had to take it all out. All these sedges are still in the ground. And so if anybody would like them, I don't have a place to put them. You're welcome to come over and dig them out and uh, do what you will with them. Um, Anything that's in this open dirt area here is, is up for grabs. The construction project starts this coming Monday. So if you're interested, contact me. 
you have about five days to come and dig some of these clumps out if you're interested and uh, take them home and plant them somewhere else. All right, and with that, uh, Jess Miller is here to talk to us about insects and native plant relationships. Jess is a naturalist at Mosquito Hill Nature Center in New London. So I will turn it over to Jess to tell us all about insects. All right, thanks, Paul, much appreciated. Let me get uh, my PowerPoint up and running here. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining this evening. Um, as Paul said, I've been at Mosquito Hill Nature Center as a naturalist for the last uh, 23 plus years. I spent a lot of that time um, doing monarch research, working with um, Karen Oberhauser, who uh, is now out of UW-Madison. Um, so a lot of my expertise is in um, milkweeds and um, the insects that, that frequent uh, milkweed plants, but we also have a 12 acre plant, uh, prairie planting out here at Mosquito Hill. And so I'm really familiar with a lot of the insects, uh, especially the plant insect and plant relations with the native prairie plants and the native insects out here. Um, so my presentation tonight is to introduce you to literally just a tiny portion of the insects that you would um, encounter maybe in your own yard or uh, on a property that, that, you, that you frequent. Um, there is no way that I can go through each and every insect in detail. Um, you know, we're talking thousands of insects, but I'll go through the ones that seem to be the most prevalent this time of the year um, with some upcoming and then also ones that I get a lot of calls about. Um, so I know that <laughs> I'm talking to a group that already knows why native plants are essential. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of buzz through this um, quickly. But as you know, native plants are adapted to our our ecosystem. They're, they're adapted to our weather and our altitude and, and everything about Northeast Wisconsin, it, which, is, which is why we encourage people to, to uh, plant and to protect native plantings. They're also our ancestors. And so we have a um, due diligence to protect our, our ancestors um, and perpetuate them as well for future generations. We also know that um, because they belong here, um, because they're recognized by other, um, by some fauna, that insects and mammals and birds and all sorts of animals utilize those native plants for food, for nesting, for habitat. Um, so it's important that we perpetuate the, the native plants. By the same token, it's important that we also perpetuate and protect native insect species as well because they belong here. They are part of the integral system. Um, when you remove one of the spokes, i.e. an insect, it has a detrimental effect either upstream or downstream with other um, animals or other insects. Big buzzword in the, in the news right now is pollination. Um, we know that our... Um, Honeybees and bumblebees are on the decline, but we also are having an, an issue with our native uh, other bees as well. And so without them, we're looking at a decline, of course, of, of fruits and vegetables. They are food for others. Insects you know, are part of the food chain. They're eaten by other insects. They're eaten by other fauna. And personally, insects are one of my favorite animals. I mean, I, I, I've been working with them so long now, uh, I've come to appreciate each and every one of them. You know, do I like deer flies? Do I like mosquitoes? Do I like wasps? Sure, on a certain level. Do I like what they do to me if I'm in their way? No, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna go out and, and eradicate them um, off the planet because I don't share their, their enthusiasm for, for biting or stinging. Um, so know that I, would, I would really like for you all to, if you don't already have one, um, garner a little, a little glimpse of, of appreciation from at least one of the insects that I share today. Um, I'll also point out that there are a number of really good field guides on the market um, that either you can, you can purchase online or your, your favorite local bookstore to help you identify the insects that are in your area. 
not all insects are bad. In fact, a very small percentage of them are bad, quote unquote bad. Um, I, the more you learn about them, the, re, the more you realize how important they are, um, especially to our native plants. So I'm gonna start off with bees. Again, a lot of, of buzz, uh, pun intended in the news about a declining population of our bees. They're in the order of Hymenoptera, which includes beads, ants, wasps, and sawflies. And there are, while 130,000 species worldwide, about 500 species in Wisconsin, and that's big. Um, Apis mellifera, which is our honeybee, and a number of the bumblebees get a lot of the attention, but it's our smaller, um, less fancy bees, if you will, that kind of, um, that don't share the spotlight that the other two do, um, do a lot, if not more of the pollinating, a lot of the work, especially early in the season before um, bumblebees and honeybees are, are active. And to note that also most of our native bees are solitary. So they're not forming big colonies like our um, honeybees do. A lot of them are, are nesting underground. A lot of them are using our plants as nesting material. So once you learn how to identify them and what time of the year that you'll see them, uh, it helps you to appreciate them a little bit more. So starting with mining bees, um, this is one of the largest groups of solitary bees. And we believe that there's about 1300 known species of mining bees. They're getting their name because they do burrow underground. The photo on the bottom shows one coming up uh, from its underground nest. Uh, I, I was seeing these nests here at the Nature Center in, in sandier soil on the upper side of our prairie. And when they excavate the soil, they leave these little clumps of soil, um, not like you would find in an ant, uh, you know, the soil around an ant nest, um, but more so little clumps. And I thought, oh, that's, that's probably a bee, um, about the size um, diameter wise of a, of a pencil. Um, they, like bumblebees, buzz pollinate, meaning they will hang on to a flower petal with their legs and they will vibrate their abdomen, thus shaking pollen onto their bodies. So they're much more effective in pollinating um, than, our, than our honeybees. And, and because they're an early spring bee, they are the ones that are out on your, um, on your blooming crab apples and apple trees and uh, blueberry plants and, and other fruit trees in the spring doing a lot of the pollination. Um, some may not see this bee directly, but this is a leafcutter bee and leafcutter bees can be identified um, in a number of ways. Most people, when I get this call say, I have these chunks of leaves, uh, like round circles. It almost looks like somebody took a, a paper cutter, a, a hole puncher and punched holes in my leaves of my of certain plants. And I say, yeah, it's probably a leaf cutter bee. And they're using their large mandibles. Uh, if you look at the picture on the, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see those very large pincher type mandibles that are used for cutting the cylindrical pieces of uh, vegetation. And what they're going to do with those is actually put them into their um, into their nests. They'll put an egg in between, and it's kind of it separates the chambers. And then they'll bring in some pollen, and that's what their offspring will eat. They are going to form their nests um, in pre-existing holes, such as um, any holes in a, in siding on a building, um, in trees, um, in hollow plant stems. And so they're often using what's already there to to build their nest. Moving on to wasps, um, they, of course they get a bad rap um, because of their temperament in often cases. Um, but we see that more with uh, usually wasps later in the season as we start getting into the fall where wasps tend to be a little bit more temperamental as they're um, preparing for overwintering um, or at least preparing the queen for overwintering. Um, but just like bees, wasps are also very ecologically important because they do pollinate. It's not their, their number one priority. Um, their number one priority is to um, perpetuate the species, um, but they do, they do some pollination. However, their benefit is that they take out a large population of insect pests, uh, soft-bodied critters like uh, caterpillars or white flies, um, sometimes katydids and grasshoppers because that's what they lay their eggs in and that's what their young will consume. 
So this is one that I find pretty fascinating. This is the grass carrying wasp. And I saw this one a number of years ago and I literally saw that top picture of the wasp carrying a blade of grass. And I thought, okay, this is one I need to look up because this is pretty cool. Um, these, this is a, a family called uh, Sphezidae and Sphezidae is the thread-waisted wasps. And you can see that if you look at the photos um, closely, there is a kind of a thread that separates the abdomen from the thorax. Um, and that, that stalk, if you will, is called a petiole. And we have many, many species of, of thread-waisted wasps. Um, none of them that I'm aware of are aggressive. I've never had a problem with them. Um, obviously, they don't like hugs, so you're so you're not gonna you're not gonna hug them. Um, but usually, their goal is to get nesting material, get food for their offspring, and then lay eggs. So the female of this grass carrying wasp is looking for tree crickets and katydids, for which she can take back to her nest, um, a nest which is created with grasses. Um, usually put into a hole, again, on the siding of a house or building or into some hollow grass uh, reeds. Um, and then they will lay their eggs, usually in the katydid or the, the other the insect, and then their offspring will kind of eat that insect from the inside out. So they are good in terms of reducing some of our, our garden pests. The great black wasp, uh, the first time I saw this, uh, it did scare me, I'm not gonna lie. They're about an inch and a half to two inches in length. Um, and of course, anytime you get a, a flying insect around your head, the, the sound is intimidating. And then when you look up and you see this large insect, it's, um, you know, it's a little unsettling. However, they're very docile. Um, I've been, the, in fact, the picture right here at the top is uh, one of them that's nectaring from, um, from a milkweed plant. And I'm always in the prairie monitoring our milkweed and see these large wasps often. And I've never had an issue. In fact, I've been up close taking photos and they've never bothered me. Again, their goal is to find um, longhorn grasshoppers, katydids, sometimes larger than themselves, pick them up, carry them off. Um, they paralyze them with a sting and then um, allow their young to feed on them within the nest. So one thing that's kind of cool, uh, there is a, a case of kleptoparasitism between these wasps and things like house sparrows and catbirds. If a catbird or a house sparrow sees these large wasps carrying a large insect to their nest, oftentimes the birds will take down the wasp and take out the the katydid or the grasshopper and, and eat it themselves. All right, we'll move on to beetles. And beetles are a group of insects from the order uh, Coleoptera. And there's about 400,000 species. So it's the largest of all the orders. Uh, we have a, a couple of beetles here on the screen. The top one, um, this is, uh, so I'm actually pointing at the elytra, which is what is characteristic of all of the beetles, whether you have a short elytra, like here in this rove beetle, a short kind of leathery pliable light elytra in this um, blister beetle, or a longer, harder elytra, like it's on this tiger beetle, but all of them share that characteristic. Um, some of these will, some of these characteristics will alter a little bit. We'll, we'll kind of switch a little bit and, and we'll talk about that upcoming. Um, not being pollinators, but insects, the beetles being more of um, just happenstance on a particular plant. And some of them do a lot of damage as we'll see with the Say's blister beetle encountered this one a number of years ago as it was completely defoliating all of our um, indigo, our wild indigo and our lupin on our property and in our prairie and looked it up and realized it was a blister beetle. So blister beetles have um, in, their, in their joints, in, in their bodies, um, cantharidin, which is a, a chemical which can cause blisters. 
Now, oftentimes the blisters aren't gonna show up. Like if you touch the beetle, it's not gonna show up on the tips of your fingers or on your hands because you have such thick skin there. But if one were to happen to fly into your shirt and say you get it like on your neck or where skin is not so thick, you may incorporate, uh, you may encounter some um, ill effects. One way to tell uh, a blister beetle is that the elytra um, does not come all the way down to the bottom of the abdomen. We can see the um, in this picture on the left here where my cursor is, you can see the abdomen kind of poking out. Um, and the slide beforehand, you saw that the elytra was very short. So on some species, it is very short and pliable on some much longer. On this Say's blister beetle, um, it's very iridescent with bright orange legs. You're not gonna mistake this for, for another insect. Uh, when I see them, it's this time of the year, they're on my wild indigo and they are, it's literally one big orgy. They are feeding, they are reproducing, um, they're in copulation, they're flying all over. They sound like Sherman tanks, they look like Sherman tanks when they're flying around. They're just a, a really hardy beetle. Um, I've had interns that have picked them up and come back to show me and I'm like, uh, you know, um, just be careful. Uh, because they can release that that um, toxin or that that chemical through their joints if if mishandled. So what's what's kind of cool too about blister beetles is that they have a very interesting life cycle um, and not one that we have a lot of time to to discuss. But the triangulans, which are the young beetles, and you can see that down in this bottom photo, it's actually enlarged. Um, it actually has, is sitting in this middle photo here. It's sitting on this native bee. And what they do is they will hitch rides called foracy. The, um, the young beetles will hitch rides on native bees and the native bees will take them back to their underground hives where the, the young blister beetles will eat the eggs or the young. Um, so, maybe not great on the, on the native bee populations, but they'll also feed on other insect eggs and other small insects as well. Uh, if you're familiar with milkweed and uh, milkweed of all kinds, you've probably seen the red milkweed beetle. Um, this is uh, in the longhorn borer beetle family and they feed solely on, on milkweed both as adults and as, as larvae. So the, the genus and species of, of this uh, insect, uh, Tetra opes and Tetro, Tetrophthalmus, uh, mean four-eyed. So if we look at the photo towards the bottom of the screen where my cursor is, you'll see that the antenna literally bisects the eyeball. Here's a part of the eye and here's a part of the eye just above and just below the antenna. Um, so the genus and species both mean four eyed because that's indeed what they have is four compound eyes. Although I would imagine that those four compound eyes are probably um, compromised because they're smaller, um, but nonetheless, there are four instead of two. Uh, you may see that there, um, on some of your milkweed where there's some boring into the stems and that could be from this milkweed beetle because the um, eggs are laid on the surface of the stem and then the larvae bore into it. Um, and then we see the, the adult beetles come uh, early summer. We'll, so we'll see them in the next couple of weeks. Um, they don't, they won't necessarily kill the milkweed. They may stunt an area um, they may wilt an area, but they won't necessarily kill your milkweed and they will do nothing to your monarchs. This I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, probably everyone on here has had some sort of run in with Japanese beetles. Um, they're a small bug that carry a big threat and they're, they're getting worse. Um, I, I've been seeing a lot more of them on my property, um, both at home and here at the Nature Center. Uh, the, the problem, the, the big challenge with Japanese beetles is that they don't care what they eat. If it's if it's plant material, they'll pretty much eat it. And and we've we've documented over 300 species and counting of, of things that they will consume. Um, the good thing is that there are um, two parasitoids that have been released in the U.S. for biocontrol. One of them is a tachinid fly, and we'll talk about tachinids in just a moment. Um, and then one's a wasp, and both of them will parasitize um, Japanese beetles. And in fact, in this middle photograph, you can see this white spot and that's a tachinid fly egg. And once that egg hatches, that larvae will burrow into the beetle, um, consuming it. 
Rose Chafer beetles are out now and in abundance. Um, as their name implies, they do like to consume um, roses of, of all species, but there are other plants that you'll find them on as well. They're small, about the size of your pinky fingernail, um, coming out about now. They're short-lived, so we'll only see them for a couple of weeks. Um, a lot of people ask, well, how can I get rid of them? They're eating my roses. They're eating you know, all my stuff. Um, I'm not an expert in eradicating, but I will tell you that um, unlike the Japanese beetles, the, the numbers of the rose chafers seem to be smaller, although that, that can vary from year to year. Um, soapy water in a bucket is great if you can go out and just grab them and, and throw them in the bucket. Um, I, I don't say that with a lot of insects. These, if they're a problem, I you know go ahead and do that. Um, also with the Japanese beetles. Usually something will come along and eat the beetles. Um, if they're non-native, like the Japanese beetles, they don't have uh, a lot of predators. I, I often encourage people to get rid of them through whatever method you can. Um, these guys are native, but just like the blister beetles, they do contain um, cantharidin, which is that toxin which can cause some um, digestive distress in um, small mammals and even birds. So I don't recommend feeding these to your um, educational salamander like my intern did today. Uh, I'll be checking on the whereabouts and, and um, whatnot of my salamander tomorrow morning. Um, the goldenrod soldier beetle. This is one that we'll see later in the summer, but it's one that I always get questions about. Um, it, we see it on goldenrod and goldenrod will bloom later in the summer, uh, but this is a good guy. And they, um, as adults, feed on nectar and pollen. They're not gonna kill plants. They're not gonna kill goldenrod uh, if you're concerned about um, the species of goldenrod you have in your garden or in your yard. Um, but the larvae seen down at the bottom photograph, their larvae do cons uh, consume uh, aphids and flies and uh, the larvae of flies and butterflies and moths and grasshoppers. So they are a, a good pest to have in your, in your garden. Moving on to weevils. Weevils are a, a small insect uh, known for their large snout. Um, they are in most circles considered a pest because they can damage cro crops like grain, wheat, cotton. Um, all of those crops have, um, have had uh, weevil damage. However, they are used as a biological control method for invasive plants like Eurasian milfoil. So the weevil that you're seeing on the screen is, is that uh, biocontrol. So in, in small doses, they're, they're good insects. I'm gonna introduce you to two others which you may have encountered on your own property. And one is the milkweed weevil. Uh, they're very secretive because they're mostly nocturnal, but we see them as soon as milkweed emerges. Um, Oftentimes you will see the, the remnants of their damage and that is uh, at the bottom of the screen, um, some uh, excess latex, that white sticky substance, um, along with part of the stem of your milkweed being um, taken out. Usually when you go up to a milkweed plant, if there's a milkweed weevil on it and you, you jostle the plant, he will uh, roll up, play possum and drop to the ground. So oftentimes we're not seeing them unless we're viewing the plant from afar. They will not kill the plant um, in, my, in my experience. They may stunt growth, they may stunt, um, they may wilt a couple of, of leaves or stems, but they typically aren't gonna kill a plant per se. But they do dig into it where they will lay the eggs in the stems and then their offspring will um, tunnel through some of the pith and eat a portion of the pith of the plant. Normally we see this on older, stre more stressed plants. Um, of course they could be stressed because the weevils have just burrowed in into them. As if wild indigo didn't have enough problems with um, blister beetles this time of the year, they also uh, have an, an, another challenge and that is with the um, wild indigo seed pod weevil. Um, very tiny. Uh, just a couple millimeters in length. Uh, this one is, is kind of fun. Uh, and I will show my students that visit in the fall, this insect. The adult weevils consume the flowers and the leaves um, of uh, Baptisia species. And then when the, the green pods form, they will burrow with their mouthpiece. So 
this, I'm placing my cursor on the rostrum, um, that, that chewing mouth part of the weevil. There's actually a chewing mouth part at the bottom of what looks like a snout. And they'll drill holes into the, the seed pods and then lay their eggs in there. The eggs will eventually come to um, maturity and then you'll get these nice little black weevils wandering around in here eating the seeds. Uh, if you're not a fan of that, um, you could um, potentially pull the, the pods off, maybe eradicating the weevils, but um, oftentimes they're, it's just superficial. They're, they're not gonna kill the plant. They very, very rarely are going to do much damage and you'll still get pods regardless. You'll still get pods with seeds. Um, and mostly because I know this, because when I, in the fall, when I open the pods up, and by this time the pods have turned black, the seeds are mature. I open the pods up, sprinkle the seeds out onto my hand and then wait for movement. And then it, often I'll see uh, one or two little weevils inside that pod moving around. Um, they will uh, overwinter if given the opportunity, if the pod does not split open. Um, and then we'll see more weevils again the, the following spring. Okay, we're moving into true bugs, uh, the uh, Hemiptera order, uh, 50, about 50 to 80,000 species, and it contains cicadas and aphids and plant hoppers and leaf hoppers and shield bugs. And they vary in size, all the way from uh, a millimeter all the way up to about six inches in length. They share some, some similar characteristics, uh, that of a rostrum, um, a beak, if you will, uh, a pointy mouth apparatus that is used for sucking um, plant juices or insect juices. And then if you look at uh, the wings on the back of, of the species that I have here, um, hemiterum means half winged. So if we look at this leaf um, bug here, we see that the, the wings have overlapped, almost forming an X. Same thing with the shield or stink bug and the same thing with this box elder bug. There's usually an X where the wings fold over and that is characteristic of most of the true bugs, such as the large milkweed bug. I'm gonna go back a slide again. This is the box elder bug where we see a lot of black down here in the lower right-hand corner where we see a lot of black on the red whereas in the large milkweed bug, we see a little black and a lot of orange. Um, and they tend to be a little bit bigger than the uh, box elder bugs. Um, and you're gonna find them almost specifically on, on milkweed species. So uh, surprise, they're found on all different milkweed plants given the name large milkweed beetles. Um, and just like monarch butterflies, they ingest toxins, the cardiac glycosides from the milkweed plants, which would make them poisonous to other predators, hence the bright color. Um, and then the adults and the nymphs feed on the seed pods, the seeds within the seed pods. So oftentimes you'll get a seed pod um, later in the summertime and it'll have uh, holes in it. And that would most definitely be from these guys. Um, these are the nymphs. Um, just bright red. They haven't developed a lot of the black coloring yet. Um, but even so, they have a rostrum, this long beak that um, can digest, um, externally digest uh, plants, plant material. So they, in a sense, regurgitate on the seeds, let that chemical dissolve the seeds, and then slurp it back up to get their nutrients. Um, the insidious flower bug. This is an interesting little bugger, uh, about two, two millimeters in length, usually overlooked in flowers, um, but I've seen them quite often in the last few years. They're part of the uh, minute py pirate bug family, which is about 500 species worldwide. Uh, they're very, very good at eradicating um, different types of plant pests such as aphids or mites or thrips or uh, as the picture over here on the lower right shows uh, white fly larvae which are um, a problem with our agricultural crops in many cases so oftentimes these insects are used as integrated pest management and they're sold commercially um, in greenhouses um, in orchards and orchards and farms we ran into these guys. Now they're they're normally on flowers. You know, normally they're um, busy eating 
eating bugs. But last year we had an issue with them um, actually biting people. They were flying around and landing on people and biting. And, and I actually looked at one under uh, a, a magnifying glass and went, oh my gosh, what, what are you doing? Um, so I don't know if there weren't enough insects out or, or what the case was, but very rarely do they interact with humans. But last year I, I had a case of, of that happening. The spined assassin bug gets its name from, uh, from the spines that you see on its body. We can kind of see some on this upper photo up here on the thorax and on the head. And then here on this bottom photo, you can see the spines on the thorax and also on the legs. And those are used for two reasons. One, to prevent predators from eating them because really who wants to eat something that's spiny like that? Um, but also it, um, it helps with the spines on the legs, it helps to hold on to prey if need be. So as all true bugs, it is going to use its rostrum to inject saliva, to externally digest its prey. And it, it, it's really, they're not, they're not super selective. Anything walking by, if it's within reach, they reach out, grab it, uh, jam it full of uh, digestive juices and then suck those digestive juices out. Um, so these are, these are one of the good guys. They, they wait in ambush, or they wait, and, and then ambush their prey, often striking from a distance. They move very quickly when they need to. The jagged ambush bug um, also is uh, a benefit on flowers and plants. They'll sit in waiting. They have these large raptorial arms, which they'll reach out for prey. Um, oftentimes just sitting in the nooks and crannies of a flower. Here's one right here, it's in yellow over on the right-hand side of the screen and it has grabbed onto a wasp. And same thing, it will inject it uh, with digestive juices and then, um, and then feed. If you are a gardener, I would wager to say that you have at some point in time uh, encountered aphids. Um, there's well over a thousand species in the US and sometimes it can be um, what's se seemingly daunting to get rid of them, um, but to also identify them. The nice thing about it is that they um, are species, oftentimes species specific. So um, certain species will, of aphids will only feed on certain species of plants. And we have three different species here. Um, this particular species, I don't know the genus uh, or species for that matter, but I see a, a red, this red species on um, false sunflower in one of my gardens. Um, I see a, a number of the yellow and orange species on my milkweed plants. And so they're consuming the juices of the plant. They're, they're sucking out the plant sap. Um, and then uh, they will excrete a sugary, substance and that attracts oftentimes ants. So if you have aphids on your plants outside, you probably also have ants on your plants outside. One of the species that uh, I encounter oftentimes on milkweed is the oleander aphid, aphis neuri. Um, it is part of one of the research projects that we do with um, the University of, uh, well, it used to be Minnesota and now it's with uh, UW-Madison with Karen Oberhauser, and that's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. We go out, we monitor milkweed weekly uh, on our property and look, one of the things we look for in addition to monarchs is the presence of uh, the oleander aphid or the aphis neri. They are um, from the Mediterranean region where oleander is native, but just like mo a lot of insects, they come in on plants, especially this tropical milkweed that we see um, second, second from the left on the bottom. Um, and then they just, they spread. Because females are parthenogenic, they can um, mate without, they can, excuse me, they can produce young without mating. So they can drop kids when, whenever they want and as many as they, as they want. So they do give birth to live wingless females to build up the populations. And then they just go ahead and start sucking out uh, plant juices. Um, these, these ones typically will survive down in the southern part of the US and then they get blown up here in the summer. Um, I don't know if they overwinter, but that's part of the study with the, with the MLMP is to find out if, they are, if they're able to overwinter up here. 
All right, so this is kind of cool. This is the milkweed aphid, different than the one we just saw. Um, these aphids have a really cool um, relationship with um, a, spe a species of ant, uh, Formica podzilica. Uh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. So most ants will tend or milk aphids, meaning they'll go up to them with their antenna or with their legs and kind of groom the aphid, causing the aphid to release the sugary substance from its anus. The ant will in turn then eat that and protect the aphid. Um, it's just this wonderful symbiotic relationship. These ants go take it a step further with this species of aphid and they protect the aphids from a fungal infection, uh, like a fungal parasite, um, Pandora neoaphidus. And that fungus, which would typically wipe out an aphid colony, uh, is kind of kept in check by this ant. So the ant, if it notices any ants that have fungal spores on it, they will re either remove the aphid from the colony and eradicate it, or they'll remove the, the fungal spores. And in return, the aphids then um, will continue to offer them a sugary treat. The ants will protect them. If you've ever had a plant where there's aphids and ants, if you touch the, the plant or even get anywhere near the aphids, the, the ants will immediately attack. Um, so they are, they are having this wonderful relationship, however um, maddening it might be because the aphids are probably sucking the life out of, out of your plants. Uh, often people wanna know how to get rid of aphids. Uh, I usually use the squish method or just insecticidal soap works, works well. Uh, moving on to butterflies and moths, um, Lepidoptera is the order of insects that include butterflies and moths. And there's about 180,000 species with, within about 126 families. Um, most of those are moths though. We have way more moths um, worldwide than we do butterflies. Um, the benefit um, to butterflies, of course, is that they're, they're beautiful, um, but most people will tell you that they don't know that this group of spiny looking caterpillars consuming their willow is what's gonna turn into this beautiful morning cloak butterfly. Um, they just assume that because it's uh, soft bodied and it's consuming their plant that it's, it's a negative. I really recommend going out and getting a, a field guide. Uh, there, there are caterpillar field guides out there, some really good ones that help you to identify whether you have um, a butterfly or moth species. And not implying that you should weigh butterfly species over moths, but it, it just gives you, it gives you a breakdown between, between the species. Um, so with, with 180,000 species, Lepidoptera makes up about 10% of the total um, living organisms. So it, it's, a, it's a fairly big uh, order. And they play a, a big important role. They are pollinators. Um, they're part of the food chain. There are a lot of animals and insects that like to eat um, soft-bodied caterpillars and, and butterflies. Um, but as I said, they can be problematic in, in large quantities. The black swallowtail is one I get a phone call about every year uh, from someone's garden. They want to know what this black, yellow, um, and green striped worm is in their in their um, garden, because the host plant for this butterfly is um, uh, Apiaceae, the carrot family. So carrots, uh, Queen Anne's lace, dill, fennel, parsley, parsnip, often things that you'd find in your garden. Oftentimes, you'll of, often find um, these caterpillars. Black swallowtails are considerably smaller than their cousins, the tiger swallowtails. In fact, blacks are about the size of monarch um, butterflies, so considerably smaller. They will have two broods, one now, and then one again in the latter part of summer. Um, what I really like about these caterpillars, other than they're just cool looking, is the fact that when disturbed, they will display an organ called an osmeterium, and that is a forked uh, pliable organ, which emits an odor, uh, which can be disagreeable to uh, repel uh, other insects that may try to consume the caterpillar. The osmeterium uh, smell 
if you've never smelled it, it's kind of smells like what the caterpillar has been eating. So oftentimes it's kind of a, um, a parsley type smell, but it also has a citrusy pineapple-y smell. So the next time you see um, any black, any swallowtail caterpillar, they all ha have this apparatus. Just give it a little pinch, more so up towards the head and the osmotarium will, will kind of pop up. Silvery chucker spot caterpillars, uh, silvery chucker spot butterflies and caterpillars right now are, are plentiful. Uh, we usually see them late spring, early summer. It's one of the first butterfly calls I get of the year. Um, what is, is this small um, inch and a half uh, in, in with butterfly, a monarch that I'm seeing here in May? Um, and what are all these caterpillars doing on my aster plants or on my sunflowers or coneflowers? And the answer is you are probably dealing with a silvery checker spot. Um, their host plant, host plant meaning the, the plant that they lay their eggs on is the Asteraceae family. So asters, sunflowers, coneflowers, and they do produce two broods in the summer, one now, and then one later in the summer. About a hundred eggs are laid and all caterpillars will typically stay together. As you see in this lower photo, all of the siblings are feeding together. Um, and that can be problematic for people who don't know what this is. They come out to their plant and go, oh my gosh, what is this? And then they wanna kill them. Um, usually to get a good look at these guys, you need to go up and kind of shake them into a bucket or into your hand because the minute you touch the plant, they drop to the ground. Um, if you're not keen on them eating your plants, um, maybe you can set aside one or two plants and let them consume them, knowing that you know, you're gonna get a, a beautiful butterfly within the next three, three to four weeks. Um, but if they are completely decimating your, your garden, hot soapy water, just dropping the caterpillars in um, is certainly a, a better option than resorting to, to sprays. Milkweed tussock moth, um, surprise, found on, on milkweed. Um, usually common milkweed is where I find this. Uh, if you look at the picture on the top, you're gonna also see oleander or aphis neri in the background. But this is what your milkweed tussock moth caterpillar looks like, um, the top photo here. But this is, the bottom photo is when I get the phone call. What is eating my milkweed? It's skeletonizing my leaves. Um, I see all these caterpillars feeding together. What is this? And that is, um, this tussock moth that is typically found middle of the summer, middle to end of summer. It's very fuzzy. Um, and that's what it does. It feeds on your milkweed plants. And usually I, you know, I, it, I don't bother with this. Monarchs are, are not going to lay eggs on plants that are already being consumed by aphids or uh, milkweed tussock moth caterpillars. They're going to look for more pristine plants. So you don't need to worry about Unless, unless you're very limited on milkweed in your area, you don't need to worry about eradicating these guys. They're perfectly fine. They're not gonna kill the plant. They're not gonna kill anything for that matter. They're just cute and fuzzy. Um, but if you have a limited amount of, of milkweed, then the soapy water in a bucket trick always works. What's cool about the, the moths is that they can produce these ultrasonic clicks um, from their timbal organs, which is in their chest. It's the same type of organ that uh, cicadas use to make their buzz. Um, and so when a bat is near, the moths can make this sound, uh, letting the, the bat know that, hey, I'm not good to eat, I'm toxic. I have you know, these cardiac glycosides in me from, from consuming the milkweed. And here's the life cycle. So we start with the egg mass here and then all these little caterpillars. And again, they feed together like, like a lot of um, caterpillars um, feeding together within a within a, a group, and then as they grow older, you'll see this this orange, black, and white fuzzy fur. The the adult moth has an orange and black abdomen, um, so that's pretty characteristic. But just with its wings closed, it's it's pretty non pretty nondescript. And then here's the the pupil casing uh, with the cocoon around it. Sphinx moths. Big phone call every year. Hey, I got something in my in my yard. It is acting like a hummingbird, but it's not a hummingbird unless we have more than one species of hummingbird. Okay, you're probably dealing with a sphinx moth. And there are several species um, in Wisconsin, 1400 species worldwide. Uh, and their host plants are a variety of shrubs, vines, and trees. So um, 
Often people will refer to the moths as hawk moths um, just because of their flight or hummingbird moths because of their flight. They do buzz by just like a hummingbird would. Uh, and then the, all the caterpillars have this horn-like structure coming off the hind end, um, off the end of their abdomen. So they get the, the term hornworms. Um, this white line sphinx moth um, is pretty close in size to, the, to an actual hummingbird. Uh, they have a very long proboscis, so they can feed from quite a distance from any flowering plants. And then the clear wing hummingbird moth, and then there's also um, a snowberry hummingbird moth that looks very bee-like, almost like a bumblebee. Um, but if you look closely, the colorations are different, um, and you'll notice that they're feeding from a distance. All right, quickly moving into flies. <clears throat> Diptera is uh, the order that contains about a thousand, or excuse me, a million different species, crane flies, mosquitoes, gnats, midges, fruit flies. Um, crane flies are often mistaken for uh, mosquitoes, but they are not large mosquitoes. They're their own independent insect. They do not have a piercing mouth part to, to feed. Oftentimes we'll see them on plants getting, <clears throat> excuse me, getting nectar. Um, as do uh, male mosquitoes, but crane flies don't have a, a biting mouth part. And then things like gnats and midges, which also don't feed at all. They, they don't have mouth parts in which to, to feed on or to bite any humans. They're just more of an annoyance to humans than anything else, but they are food for, uh, for other insects. So one of the biggies here is, here is the tachinid fly. It's the family tachinidae. And these guys are good and bad. There's about 150,000 species of flies um, and uh, over about 160 families. And a big number of those are tachinidae. They are good and bad in that they are parasitoids. So they will lay eggs on soft bodied critters. Some are species specific. Some will search out uh, caterpillars, uh, monarch caterpillars for that matter. Some will just search out any soft bodied critter, lay their eggs. So you can see in this photo, the bottom photo here, these white spots on this caterpillar, and those are tachinid fly eggs. The egg will hatch. Um, the larvae will crawl into uh, its new host, consume it from the inside out, and then uh, leave the, the host um, when it's time to, to pupate and to go through metamorphosis. So they are good uh, for eradicating some agricultural pests, but um, in terms of um, soft-bodied critters like monarch caterpillars or other um, moth and butterfly caterpillars that we really like, sometimes um, that's not, not so good. The golden fly uh, golden rod fly, gall, gall fly, excuse me, um, is one that is um, often asked, what is this big bulbous thing on this golden rod? And that is, um, well, it's a, it's a gall and it's formed by this fly who lays its eggs on the stem. Um, the eggs hatch, they burrow into the stem and release a chemical. And that chemical hormone then grows the plant material up and around the egg, protecting the egg. Um, if you were to cut this gall open, you'd notice a number of these little um, larvae inside, sometimes one, sometimes more of these larvae inside. What's interesting about this whole story is that, first of all, they're not going to kill the plant, so they're not going to kill your goldenrod. Um, and by the way, goldenrod is a great plant because um, it blooms later in the season. It's a great nectar plant for a lot of our later um, uh, nectar feeding insects and birds. So. This larvae inside this gall will spend the winter in here. It will consume the, the flesh inside the gall and kind of live in here like a little apartment building. But once it goes through metamorphosis, of course, it's gonna become a fly. And this fly does not have a chewing mouth part. So what the, the larvae needs to do is before winter, it needs to chew a tunnel from the center of the gall to the edge, inside edge of the gall. And then it backs up and spends the winter inside the middle of the gall. Fast forward to spring. Now this fly needs to get out of the gall, but again, no chewing mouth part. So what it does is it inflates its forehead with air, presses that forehead up against the interior edge of the gall, bursting it open, and then being able to fly out. That is, in if 
um, the gall has not been parasitized or it has not been opened up and eaten by say chickadees or woodpeckers who have now learned that the gall contains a tasty little treat, uh, especially in the winter time when food is scarce. Surfid or hoverflies, uh, these guys are great. Um, the hoverflies really do no damage they make uh, to your plants. They'll come up, they'll um, look for nectar in your plants. They literally will land on you. They have no chewing mouth part. They're not gonna um, bother you at all. It is, however, the larvae, um, the young flies, the fly larvae that do all of the damage and, and damage to other insect pests on the plant. And so they're, they're the good guys. They will eat aphids and thrips and all sorts of other um, plant sucking critters. And um, so they are definitely known as, as a, a good pest to have. Uh, robber flies or assassin flies. These can be a bit intimidating because they're, they're large. Some, are, some look like bumblebees. They have these markings, black and, and yellow markings like this one below. Um, but their job is to find pests on plants. Sometimes they'll find them midair. Sometimes they'll land on the plant, reach out, grab them, and then suck the, the daylights out of them. There's about 850 species of robber flies in North America, and these guys are cool and they are fast. Um, they buzz loud. Again, just that's just their wings, but they will take down anything. They'll take down wasps. They'll take down, in this case, hoverflies in this picture above, uh, box elder bugs in the picture below. Um, really, really awesome, aggressive hunters. Um, and, and very well known in the bug community because there's so many species. All right, moving on to lace wings. Most of the time I get calls about the stalked eggs on leaves and uh, that's very characteristic of, of lace wings. These guys are also used as a bio, bio control methods because their larvae do consume um, other insects on plants. So you can see this lower picture here. Uh, with this uh, lacewing larvae chewing on, on an insect pest. Some of the larvae will actually camouflage themselves on plants by putting dead insect parts on their bodies. Um, sometimes they'll camouflage themselves with sand or dirt. Um, it's just so that they can sneak up on other plant pests and consume them. All right, spiders, uh, we'll quickly go through spiders. Um, there's about 50,000 spiders in about 129 families, 3,000 of those making their home in North America. Um, venom is used to, to, to paralyze and to kill prey, and they very, very rarely do anything to humans. We are not a problem. We are, we are not food for spiders. Um, and, and people often get these mysterious bites in the middle of the night and they blame spiders, but actually they're probably getting bit by uh, fleas or mosquitoes or ticks or mites or something else because spiders just aren't, aren't interested in biting you. In fact, spiders are great for your garden. They kill all, if not most of the pests that are in your garden. And in this case, the nursery web spider, they're really good moms. They protect their young until their young will molt the first time and then they go out on their own. So. Spiders are, are very caring, nurturing um, critters. Crab spiders are often seen in flowering plants. This is um, a type of, of crab fly, uh, spider called the flower spider or the goldenrod crab spider. And this one can change color. It can go from yellow to white within a couple of days and it will just perch. It doesn't make a, a web. It just perches in a, a flower and does a, an ambush on um, other insects like this bee in the bottom photo and, and does what spiders do. They, they digest the juices from inside the insect. Orb weaver spiders, I always get this panic attack. What do I do to get rid of orb weaver spiders? And I say, nothing, leave them alone, please. They are amazing in your garden. They eat grasshoppers. They eat any flying, hopping insect that gets into their web. There's over 100,000 kinds of, of, of orb weaver spiders. And we've got some remarkable ones in, in Wisconsin. Yes, they can be large. Yes, their abdomens can get to be the size of, of a nickel or a quarter. Um, but they consume a lot of um, insect pests. 
They're beautiful. Um, and in the case of this argiope, this black and yellow argiope, even their webs are cool. They make this uh, zigzag called a uh, stabilimentum, which is this kind of this lightning bolt shape pattern. Um, and, and we don't know exactly why. We, there are some schools of thought that it's possibly due to, um, they, they want um, like birds, like larger things that might fly through the web to know, hey, there's something here. I don't want you to fly through my web and then I have to redo the web. Um, it could have to do with attracting insects. Um, we're, we're not real sure, but the fact is some of these, some of these spiders make these incredibly elaborate webs and they're just gorgeous. Um, I found one of these um, marbled orb weaver spiders uh, last year in our prairie and she was just the sweetest little thing and she just crawled on my hand and um, I was pulling some invasive species and she, they don't bite, they're not aggressive unless, you're, unless you pinch it or are act aggressively towards it. Um, she just really wanted to get out of my way. Um, so they're, they're really beneficial uh, to have in a, in a garden. Um, so I'll end it there. Um, just, I, I love, if you're an insect fanatic and I, I hope at least you, you are um, considering being one now, um, Gary Larson, the Gary Larson cartoons or, or comics are awesome for insect humor. So you know, we have a, an insect here at the door and it says, calm down Edna. Yes, it's some giant hideous insect, but it, it, it could be some giant hideous insect in need of help. Um, and that's, I always hope that um, people will look at insects in that way that, okay, it may be ugly to them, uh, it might be hideous, but there's probably something beneficial um, about that insect. So um, thank you. And we'll move on to questions if there are any. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. It was good to see my my old friend from grad school, Yuri Kyapsis, the milfoil weevil, too, in your yes. presentation. Great. Uh, we have one question in the chat from Carrie, wondering what we can do to boost native bee populations. And I have a, a different bee question for you after that one. Um, plant more native plants, plant more flowering plants. Um, stop using insect, insecticides and um, all chemicals, herbicides and pesticides. I mean, that is that is one of the largest issues that we have is chemicals depleting um, our insect populations. Also, habitat loss. If you keep in mind that uh, oftentimes many of our native bee species are um, ground nesters, and so having some bare ground is not necessarily a bad thing. I know a lot of gardeners say, "Yeah, but then the weeds move in." Well, if, if you have some bare ground and you notice that there are some um, burrows being used, um, allow, that, allow that to stay bare ground um, if you can. Um, but really the, the big thing is, is stop with the, the use of herbicides and pesticides and, and make sure that they have a, a food source. They have native plants um, that they can nectar from, that they can get pollen from, because sometimes that does go back to their hive depending on the species. Um, but having a diverse habitat where you're encouraging lots of insects to come in, as you saw in the PowerPoint, a lot of these insects need other insects in order to feed their offspring. So maintaining that diversity and getting rid of the monoculture mindset uh, is super important. So very good question, Carrie. I'll follow that up with a question about honeybees. Um, looking for your opinion, I guess, um, on the the prevalence of honeybees and uh, the the raising of honey honeybees. Now, it sort of uh, it's sort of conveyed as a as an environmentally friendly thing that they're bringing in these bees and they're helping the bees and. I struggle with that a little bit because they're not native bees. And so we're right. bringing in these bees that are not native, which are just competing with the bees that are native. And I'm not sure how I feel about that, whether that's really helping anything or actually causing more problems. So I'm just curious what your opinion is on that. Yeah, working with the native beekeepers here at the Nature Center, of course, their opinion is, well, they're, they're valuable um, because they're such... Um, 
good pollinators, but you're right, they are taking they are taking jobs away from our native bees. And and that's of course one thing that that we we overlook. And I and I think part of it is native bees just aren't as known. You know, we don't spend a lot of time promoting our native bees. Um, we don't often see our native bees. Oftentimes our native bees are so small, they come out really early. They're ground nesters, so they're not, you know, they're not big and showy like a bumblebee. They're not big and showy uh, or in your face, um, tongue in cheek, like um, like a honeybee. Um, but you're right. They one thing that that we know is happening is honeybees are being worked to death, quite literally. Um, we're trucking honeybees all over the country. We're expecting them to work to pollinate our fruits and vegetables out of season. You know, we can have strawberries in January because of the fact that we have bees. Um, we can have blueberries any time of the year. We can have almonds all the time. Um, so I, I too, Paul, struggle with that concept of let's just truck um, our Apis mellifera, which again is not a, a native species. Let's truck that all over the country and work it to death so that we can have these, these luxuries of fruits and vegetables year round. I think it's gonna come down to education. I think we need to, um, as educators, as um, promoters of, of native plants and of, of native insects, so we need to talk to people and keep that dialogue open um, about the benefit of our native pollinators. You know, Appleton's do, does a great job of, of having a, a pollinator um, week um, festival every year, um, doing programs, um, getting the word out. I think as naturalists, as uh, members of Wild Ones, as, as anybody who is a professional or amateur um, uh, um, teacher on, on any scale, I think we need to just keep that dialogue open that we need to promote native bee species. And again, it goes back to Carrie's question is, what can we do to, to, to up that population? And it's, we have to get over our dependence of using chemicals to eradicate um, insects and to eradicate plants. It's, it's not only directly killing plants and directly killing insects, but it's getting into our air, it's getting into our water. So what does that, what does that show? What does that hold for us going going down doing going down the road um but yeah education is definitely the key we have to keep the, um talking to people about the importance of of native bees and, and i think uw extension has done a really good job with that they offer a number of online pdfs that um profile native bee species uh, i've been trying to do that on my own facebook page here at the nature center um, the mosquito hill uh, facebook page so making people aware, I think is, is the key. Um, but in terms of, will we ever reduce our dependence on, on Apis mellifera? I don't know. It, it may come to a point where they just completely burn out. Uh, the price of bees right now is astronomical. To, to buy a, a, a queen or to buy a hive is, is getting to be um, just too costly for beekeepers. So, you know, maybe we'll start seeing a shift in the in upcoming years. Thank you. We have another question from Carrie about your opinion on Mason bee houses. Um, <laughs> it's funny you should mention that. I just had a, a group of Girl Scouts last week uh, bring out Mason bee, bring out a, a Mason bee house. I don't have a problem with them. Um, in fact, I, I rather like that um, scout groups and um, different organizations are getting on that bandwagon. Whether or not they get used to um, whether or not they get used, the, those homes get, get used is, is, a, is another uh, question entirely um, because bees will not search, search out a house. Just like, you know, the big craze 20 years ago were butterfly houses with these, these houses with these slits and I'm thinking that, oh, butterflies will go in them and get out of the inclement weather. Well, it, that's just not their thinking. Um, we do know that, that native bees, when they're, they're looking for a place to, um, to nest, they'll search out um, cavities, whether that be in a, a hollow uh, grass um, or in the in a hole in the building or, or whatever that they deem um, the right diameter for for the job. 
these houses may or may not fit the bill. My guess is that you're going to see less bees using them and bees using more native um, natural materials because that's just what they're accustomed to. But I don't poo-poo anybody for putting them up. I don't poo-poo anybody for trying to promote them because again, it's the dialogue. We just want to keep that, that dialogue open and promote native species. So on that same note, uh, I've, I've also heard that those houses are potentially problematic because you're encouraging a solitary bee to basically live in a community and it's maybe more, more opportunity for parasites or diseases parasites. to spread. Right. Yep, exactly. And, and, and normally those homes and people who are building those homes, the directions usually state, hey, if you're going to use these, you need to clean them out on a regular basis because A, you can get disease that builds up or fungus that builds up in those houses if they're not if they're not cleaned properly. Um, or you get bees that will nest on top of bees, on top of bees, on top of bees, on top of bees. And so some of them can't get out because you don't have a way out because there's a wall on one side of these boxes. So yes, there are pros and cons. Um, I, most of these boxes, most of these hives aren't going to harbor I'll be honest, most of them aren't going to harbor many insects at all because insects are not used to nesting in a in a man-made structure to that degree. I mean, they like a single hole here and a single hole there because they are solitary nesters. Um, so I don't I don't see that these these homes are going to be the demise of our native bees. Um, on the contrary, I think again, it it um, opens up a, a world to people to get into learning about native bees. Um, but I, I think we have to do so. I, I think we have to educate as well um, about the, the benefits or um, the cautions of using these man-made structures. Great points, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I'll give everyone a minute to go ahead and type questions into the chat if you have anything you'd like to ask Jess. And uh, Jess, I have one other question personally that uh, I've asked a couple other people and nobody seems to know, and, and you may or may not know, but uh, at our old house in particular, and occasionally at, at the house we're in now, we get these really small wasps that are just a few millimeters long and they land on humans and they either bite or sting exposed skin and they leave this little mound with a hole in the center um, and I've put them under the dissecting scope and it, it definitely looks to be a little wasp but I've I, what I should do is just collect one of these and send it to the insect diagnostic lab or something but I yeah. haven't done that yet but I was just curious if you have any idea what that is yeah, are they black and white striped uh I don't do remember, remember. Um, I distinctly remember a couple of times seeing, I believe they're ground nesting bees. I don't know that they're ground nesting wasps, but they okay. might, I think they're ground nesting bees. I don't know the, I don't know the genus and species, but I've seen them on two different occasions. Um, one was under um, a garden I had it in behind my house underneath some decaying wood. And I accidentally got in that area with a hose and they came up and they were maybe four to five millimeters in length and they were black and white striped and they they did sting me and I did get a, a reaction I don't remember there being a, a little hole in the middle but it was a couple of years ago and then most recently I saw one on my back on my porch and it was trying to get into a hole um, on my screen porch frame um, and I know I recognized it as being the same species and I'm wondering if it isn't some species of of native bee um, but that's about as much as I can I can tell you. I have seen if it's the same one where that that you're talking about. I, I've seen them, but I don't I don't know the genus or species. Okay, in this case, it's we'd be just sitting on the patio or something, and it, just like you'd get mosquitoes or gnats that'll yeah. show up and bug you. These ones would it'd be the same thing, but these ones would actually land on you and bite you. And just when they fly around, it, it's, it'd be hard to tell whether it was a gnat or the, one of these little wasps. They're, they're oh, barely shit. larger than a gnat. Yeah. But yeah, occasionally they would land on you and then you, you'd feel a little bite and then it would turn into this, this little mountain on your, on your arm. Yeah. I haven't had that experience. I, I only experienced when I, when I disturbed the nest um, that I got zapped. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. 
All right. The mystery continues. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for presenting to us, Jess. Most certainly. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I'll uh, leave it for just a, a few seconds here in case anyone has a question. Otherwise, we will see everybody at next month's meeting. Uh, and if anyone wants those sedges that are in my front yard or would like to help with the Schmeekly Reserve planting, please let myself or Jill Zier know and we'll fill you in with more details. I don't see any more questions. So thanks again, Jess. Have a great night, Thank everybody. Thanks much.